The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the hosts and guests as individuals and do not necessarily reflect those of advertisers or sponsors. This show is intended as education and commentary only. The producers strive for verisimilitude, but nothing said on this podcast should be taken as fact by the listener or viewer without performing due diligence. While generally considered safe for work by way of content, some language may be considered offensive by more sensitive viewers or listeners. All right, cans on, mic's up, level's good. You got me over there? All right, let's roll. This is Booth to Booth, your direct line to the latest in home voiceover production with your favorite home VO experts throughout the industry, all across the internet, and all around the world. Booth to Booth is brought to you by the Narrowband Broadcast Network, NBBN. The focus is on you. By Andrew Scott Media, making your media matter. By Booth Stuff, unique VO fashion and swag that's as loud and proud as you are. And by the kind support of our viewers and listeners all around the world via Kofi. Kofi, helping you give back to the creators that help you the most. The session clock is running and all the mics are hot. So let's patch in and get this session started. Here's your host, VO coach, narrator, and producer, Andrew Scott. And hello and welcome back to Booth the Booth, the big little show all about VO. I am Andrew Scott, and today I am really pleased to say that I'm getting an opportunity to talk with Dan Friedman. Dan is an author, a uh, voice talent, a voice director, a sound man, uh, and a musician and the author of Sound Advice, a voiceover from an audio engineer's perspective, and most notably, Zen and the Art of Voiceover. Dan, thanks a lot for being here today. Thanks for joining us on Booth to Booth. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I am doing well, thank you. And again, thanks for being on. You know, I, uh, I started following you shortly after I bit the bullet and dove in to start doing voiceover full time. Uh, your blog was a uh, an integral part of my introduction into voiceover from home specifically, and the wisdom that you posted in and do still post on that blog really formed my entrance into voiceover. I'm interested, though, to know to begin about your entrance to voiceover. We always start off booth to booth with new people with an origin story. How'd you wind up getting into this wacky business? Because I was in, a, in an even wackier one before that. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, we both share that. Yeah, uh, a couple of wackier ones before that, actually. Uh, but thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, no worries. Uh, so, yeah, I worked in live sound uh, is how I really got my introduction into sound, uh, w- which I got through working with bands doing promotional stuff. I was doing photography and writing promo packs and doing uh, literary type stuff or journalistic type stuff. Uh, And then I found my way into running sound and did that for 10 years of my career simultaneously while I was starting these other areas of my career. I worked in radio for several years Uh, and then I began managing a recording studio in the year 2000, uh, the year I got the job in 1999 and started in January of 2000 and, uh, managed that studio for a year and that was, and they specialized in voiceover for telephony. So we were doing all the sound for banks and the sound for cars. And I worked with Susan Bennett, who actually I actually uh, wired and built the, her studio uh, that she later did Siri from. Very uh, cool. So I did her Siri stuff, Siri stuff with her before she became Siri. Before they knew it was going to be used as Siri. Yeah. Well, uh, no, she did that, you know, after the fact I, I didn't work with her in those sessions because I was working, I was working with her pre Siri. Right on. 
I worked with her a little bit during that time, just not on those sessions. And then I worked in a production studio for 13 years where I was, it was like the, the, the grinding it out, you know, ev everything from radio commercials, multiple per day in automotive, medical, and corporate narration, audiobooks, some promo, uh, some animation, uh, I'll, it was everything. And right. we, and it was high volume. And on the years that we were busy, I was busy, you know, very busy every day, right. uh, doing it, listening to hundreds of talent, uh, on thousands of sessions over the course of my time there, directing them, coaching them. They, as I said, uh, a little bit earlier, uh, I had never even intended to write my first book until they kind of prompted me to do it. They yeah. said you, the I had talent a couple literally prompted you to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I had no intention. In, oh, my chair is falling apart here. <laughs> oh, yours, yours too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need, does anybody even fix those? I don't know. Uh, we just uh, replace them, right? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Anyhow, yeah, I had never had any intention of writing a book or anything like that. I, 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 they literally, after I got off the phone or was on the phone with a couple of talent within a couple of weeks, the, within the same couple of weeks, they said, you know, you ought to write a book. And I, you know, the first time I blew it off, the second time I was like, eh, I don't yeah. know, maybe and then by I the could. Fifth, by the fifth or sixth time of people saying it, you're like, okay, apparently this has got to be a thing. Well, you know, it was funny because the third time that prompted me to finally, you know, pull the trigger on that initially was that someone pissed me off in a session. And I said, you know what? I'm going to write a book because <laughs> that's, this can't happen. People don't, why do this, they behave this way? This, this will not stand, man. This aggression yeah. will not stand. <laughs> and it, and it just really occurred to me, this is somebody who should have known better, I felt. Uh, in the way that they were behaving in the session, they had mm. a little bit of a diva complex uh, at the time. And not unknown, right? Not unknown, and, and that's okay. But you got to remember, this was a world that was changing, right? This we're going yeah. back. I mean, the world was changing then, mm -hmm. so there was less time for that. There was, le I mean, it was 2011. <laughs> you know, so a lot was happening. People were doing this from home now regularly. Yeah. It was our, I had already been doing remote sessions for over 10 years and some people were just discovering it. And then a lot of people didn't even discover it until the pandemic happened. Right. I'm so glad that you brought that up. I was, when I was in radio, I was setting up ISDN lines all over Atlanta yeah. and yep. Tampa. We were broadcasting live from various locations, and this is going back to 1999, mm -hmm. 1998. So ISDN was, uh, you know, the thing. And I was, we were broadcasting live on ISDN lines uh, way back then. And I was going and putting in the orders and bringing the equipment out and plugging it all in, setting in the spit, the spids. In all its asynchronous digital glory, man. It, it, you know, but that's the way we did it to get a clear yeah. connection, especially yeah. in a place uh it, it, it was even more important in Atlanta than it was in Tampa because in Tampa, we were able to use just the radio tower because it was tall, sure. it was flat, and we were able to get a signal from wherever we were. Georgia ain't that. That's exactly right. So we, we did a lot of, uh, when we needed to really sound pro, we were setting up ISDN lines all over Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And I was that guy. On top of going to, I mean, concerts, we were backstage at concerts. We, sure, you know, all doing remotes, stuff. yeah. That's exactly right. So it was it was a great time, and it was really great experience to when I finally got out, out, off the road, so to speak, and moved into a studio permanently where it was like, okay, this is, this is great because I have all this knowledge of this equipment already, and plus the audio engineering experience and right. I was ready to have a family and I wasn't interested in living the lifestyle at that time anymore yeah. and, and, and knew that it was probably for the best. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, and that, and you, it was time. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so anyway, uh, and you know, uh, here we are and it's been awesome.
what occurs to me that you and I both share and that I think honestly um, is shared with a lot of people who have have some significant roots and some have gotten some significant traction in our very weird industry is that you and you like me have been a lifelong listener, not just somebody who hears something, but somebody who hears something and then mindfully dials in on it and goes, how does that sound happen? How does that sound happen? And not only that, how can I manipulate that sound to either make it sound different or make it sound clearer or make it sound better? You know, before the call, we were talking about both of us have that Gen X experience of taking that little plastic condenser microphone with the weird little plastic foot on it and putting it in front of a speaker in order to record our favorite song because we couldn't go get it. Do you know why I still have this next? This is the best gift I ever received. I got this when I was 12 and I was so happy because this meant that I could actually record the songs from the radio directly yep. to the cassette and not yep. use that little condenser microphone. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. That was, that was a yes. sea change moment when that happened in a young, a young kid's life back in the I 80s. And furthermore, I could also buy the music that I wanted to hear and right? really hear it in full fidelity. So it was that it was huge. And this was the best it, to this day. I still think it might be one of the best gifts I've ever received. Well, it's definitely probably one of the most formative because, yeah, that puts you like me. That puts you on a path. And it does. there was no going back at that point, you know. Uh, no. and, and then the, the world of mixtapes opens up for you, right? You know, yeah. you're just like, not only that, I can put what songs I want on a compilation tape and yeah. kind of be my own radio station. You that's, know? that's, that's exactly right. And I, and it was even more fun in a way when it became CDs because you could put a lot more on them. Exactly. <laughs> and yeah. it took a whole, and a whole, and it took a whole lot less time. So when we're talking about the tools that it takes to be a, good working voice talent. Talk a little bit about listening. What has your life of being an active, mindful listener provided for you by way of your profession and getting into the profession? Do you think that it gave you an edge or do you think that it's something that talent really need to be more aware of? Totally more aware of it. Now, this sound, it feels like a little bit of a contradiction because what we, especially as a coach, I say, you can't focus on how you sound. Okay. Mm -hmm. You should focus on the emotions. However, what I can tell you is that the reason why this is so important and, and that focusing on the emotions of it is really what's the most important and why listening attentively and intentionally matters so much is because and experience as well is because you're building a library of sound. Mm. You are building a library of sound in your mind as to how certain people or life or different sounds uh, occur in the natural world. And I know this sounds kind of woo woo and maybe kind of, you know, kind of broad lens kind of stuff. But if you think about it, just listening takes time. And I have spent so much of my life intentionally listening for very specific things in very different ways and including emotions and is there a T at the end of a word or right, uh, all this stuff. And the listening part is so important because you're building this library of sound and you are putting it in different contexts. And to be honest with you, if you've only been around 20 years, Right. When I was when I was 25 years old and I was going to run my first live show ever, I was terrified. <laughs> yeah. Terrified. We had a, a fairly big band for the area come in and they actually brought in their own sound guy. Okay. And, you know, I knew how to turn the system on. I knew how to get sound out of it. I right. knew how to basically set levels. But I had no idea how to necessarily make it sound good. Like I, it was trial and error. And right. of course, everything's a manual knob. So nothing's on a screen. Mm -hmm. it, it is, it is, right. And I was terrified. And all I could do 
was learn. All I was there to do, you know, initially that day was was to, uh, you know, just hold my shit together. Yeah, not <laughs> screw up so badly that the crowd starts leaving. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and but but in a way, you know, I was so green that they had us. They the band actually brought in their own sound guy, and I was just the systems engineer for that right. evening. Basically, mm -hmm. you were the but house either, sound guy. Yeah. Yeah, but either way, I told the guy, I said, okay, when you leave tonight, you got to put everything right back the way you found it, mm -hmm. <laughs> which of course is the dumbest possible thing right. anyone could say, right? Because yeah. because I thought I had it, you know, right. I had, anyway, it was ridiculous, right? And that's just how green you are. You're so green, you don't even know how yeah. green you are. Yeah, you don't and, know how stupid you just sounded. <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> you know, we kind of talked a little bit about coaching. I know we're going to get into coaching a little bit later, but that, that sometimes when there are people that are getting into, you know, coaching that have a little bit of experience, they often don't realize, right. They're basically saying those types of things without realizing how dumb it might sound to somebody who's been in the business a very long time. Yeah. And I'm not saying that they're all saying dumb things. I'm just saying it's a little bit about perspective and wisdom and, listening with intention for a long time. And I, I mean, I even wrote a blog about this and I know it's in my book as well. And that really is, you know, anybody who's been listening with intention for a long time, nobody else can replicate no. their, their experience and their time doing that. Agreed. Now I still do it different than other people. And there's plenty of people who've done it a lot longer than me, but there aren't, there aren't, thousands of people that have been listening to voiceover as long as I have, or with the intention that I have, right. There's maybe hundreds. Right. Yeah. And, and of those, there's even fewer that put themselves out there that want to, you know, focus on whichever end of the business they want to focus on, or maybe they don't want to do it at all anymore. Maybe they've retired. I mean, we are, I am getting a little older, so some yeah. are, you know, dropping off in the, uh, you know, from the industry and that, and we're getting younger people in the industry and they're also seeing, they've also been through, you know, kind of this collective trauma. Uh, I think we were <laughs> yeah. talking about earlier yeah. and, and people are, you know, people are responding uh, to, I don't know how we got off on this bunny trail. What happened? Don't worry about it. That's, it's it's a bunny good. trail. I, I think um, what even was the question? I don't, I don't oh, remember. It doesn't matter. It's my show. We get to do what we want. Um, I, 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 I want to touch back though on, on something that I think might actually be missing from people interested in voiceover here and now. And, you know, you just, you just encapsulated it for you. It's the same reason why, in my book, The Quick and Dirty Guide to the Home Voiceover Industry, my first chapter is all about being young and being that listener and growing up in that world of VO before everybody was doing it from home. I, I spend a, a not insignificant amount of time talking about how I became aware of voiceover as a thing and the people that you know, for one reason or another became icons of that announcer thing for me, people like Don Pardo, people like, uh, Don LaFontaine, um, you know, those, those iconic voices of our generation from the generations earlier, you know, even Gary Owens, right. From Rowan and Martin's laughing, all those things shaped the path forward into home VO. I mean, most famously, uh, Don LaFontaine, who was, you know, at one point in time, the, the head of Paramount Pictures, um, he, he finally got tired of having to go into the studio. So what did he do? He got a hold of people who knew about these newfangled things like ISDN and built a studio in his home. And, you know, uh, you know, one of my good friends, one of the friends of the industry, uh, George, George Whittem, George, the tech from over at, uh, you know, VO body shop, he Absolutely. worked with Don and, you know, he was one of the guys. And one of the reasons why I think, and I, I know I sound really nostalgic and old man yelling at cloud kind of thing, but I think that it's still important for new talent and people interested in coming into this industry now understand where this industry came from. And that, like you said, it's not 
something that's always been there. It really kicked over round about the millennium. And one of the things that I explain to people is that up until that time, we didn't really have hard drives that spun fast enough to record a decent signal in 44.1 or 48 kilohertz. It, it, the technology wasn't there yet. But then all of a sudden, when that techno technological barrier was taken away, now this becomes a thing for everybody. But that doesn't give you the experience of that deep listening that we as kids and young adults and second chairs and studios had to develop listening for things that aren't obvious, listening for overtones, or like you say, when we're directing people, listening for that emotion that you have sounds a little bottled up. We need to open that up. And just that little change completely changes the sound and the shape of a reed. That kind of experience because it's so easy to step into this world, spend $200 on a mic, put some foam up on your walls, and you call yourself a voice actor. The, the experience of going through it the old-fashioned way still, has, still brings some really relevant wisdom into the here and now. Well, I've got two points I've got to make. And I'm gonna for, if, if I don't make them quick, I'm going to forget them. I'm shutting up. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the first one is, is that prior to around 1995-ish, 96-ish, we couldn't see our audio. Right. We couldn't see it. We had to trust our ears because we watched it on, uh, you know, we watched VU meters and we listened to it on tape and we had to trust our ears. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until we were able to see our audio that people began to stop trusting their ears and just start looking. They started trusting only their eyes. And when, as I always say, once your audio leaves your studio, nobody looks at it ever again. They don't need to. They shouldn't That's an need to. Excellent point. All right. Now that's the first thing. Now the second point, and this part might blow your mind a little bit. Bring it. Okay. You said around the change of the millennium. You're Ish. absolutely right. It was around 2000. Now, a lot of things were happening at that time. And again, a lot of people of today have no perspective on this and it's not their fault. They just, they weren't around. Right. But it, mm -hmm. the industry absolutely changed 100%. And it in, first of all, the fact that, yes, let's start with the fact that we could see audio and we could begin to do this from our homes in a relatively inexpensive way for the first time ever. Prior to that, the equipment was too expensive, the, it was too bulky. You, you, you couldn't have a good quality recording without a lot of money invested in, and a lot of a, a good space that really would need to be cooled and treated too expensive for the vast majority of people. That all sure. changed with technology. The second big change is the internet was really starting to blow up at this time. Mm -hmm. I mean, prior in the late nineties, internet commerce was really beginning. It was yeah. the, I mean, it was gangbusters. It, 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 it it was like nothing before. It was just getting to the point now where you could get it fast enough where you did not have to sit around for five minutes waiting for a page to load. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, yes, but it was getting to a point where it was a tolerable now for most people that they could sit there and do work and that sort of thing. Now, here's the mind-blowing part. The actors were on strike. That is correct. The actors were on strike. and. Companies needed their work done and they started to go outside of that business. And when the actors came back to work, the union never did anything about voiceover. Mm -hmm. And that fundamentally changed the industry into a non-union business. And one of the production companies I worked for, we were grinding out non-union commercial spots. You know, I mean, that's, it's just the truth of the matter. And yeah. the, and it's because of those things. We're kind of at a very similar place again. Ironically so, yeah. And that's why I bring it up and say it's a little mind blowing because if you think about it, we're very much in the same place and moving forward as the 
negotiations now begin with SAG-AFTRA and I'm not in the union because I'm in a right to work state. I've, I, I've, I've done many union jobs over the years. I'm, you know, it, it doesn't matter my union status. The point is I support it. I support Same. that. I support, I support that something absolutely be done right now to put some barriers in place that are going to solidify the industry and bring some stability so that we know how we're going to go moving forward and so that people are protected yeah. and pay, paid fairly and protected. We have to because, I mean, art, man, it's the reason for living. <laughs> uh, no argument, man. Not from me. Uh, so I'm glad that you brought up and you're right. It did blow my mind because the 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 writers and actors strike uh, of the millennium, which uh, you're absolutely right. Most people getting into the business today have no idea that that was even a thing that that brought change to media on whole. That's how we got reality television. That's how we got Survivor and all this other stuff, because the writers and the actors were on strike. But with it, with it now, I think you're right in that the people watching are different because they don't have that history and they don't see that the millennium for us in the, uh, for lack of a better way of saying it, uh, the media world, that was a, that was a sea change. And it might very well be that we're going through that sea change again no. We're, we're we're absolutely in the midst of it. It's not over. We're in the midst of it. It's like a new renaissance. Yeah. And who knows if we'll even live to where it ends, right? It could continue beyond our lives. It could go in, right? I agree. Um I agree. I, I, I really, I, I really don't know what all of it is going to lead to necessarily, but I do know that it the if my history serves me correctly then I know that we are at the beginning of something different. I don't know. I'm not going to judge it. I don't know if it'll be good or bad. I think there'll be some good and I think there will be some bad, but I know we're, we're definitely uh, poised for something way different and we need something different. I just hope it's the right different. (laughs) Well, and you know, the different that we need. (laughs) And I think, uh, you know, a big part of making or trying to ensure that the good things come out of it is going to be what we're going to talk about on the other side of this break. This is the narrow band broadcast network. I'm Andrew Scott. This is booth to booth. And I am spending some quality time, uh, with someone who earned my respect long ago. Dan Friedman, uh, author of Zen and the Art of VoiceOver. And we're going to talk about that and a bunch of other stuff when we come back. Stick around. Don't go anywhere. See you later. Bye. Booth to Booth is brought to you in part by BoothStuff.com, the home of the world's most unique VO casual fashion and swag. You know, this thing that we do is pretty unique. So slap on a Booth Stuff t-shirt that tells the world, or, you know, your cat, that being in a tiny room by yourself is where you truly belong. Shirts, hats, pants, mugs, and more. Well, not a lot more. Actually, that's pretty much it. Anyway, Booth Stuff is the one and only home for VO-centric swag that lets the world know what you do with that mouth of yours. So head on over to BoothStuff.com and get something that shows the world who you are and what you love to do. BoothStuff.com. Loud and proud. And hello and welcome back to Booth to Booth, the big little show all about VO. I, of course, am Andrew Scott, and I am talking today with Dan Friedman. Dan is an author of two books that really have kind of struck a chord with me. One is Sound Advice, voiceover from an audio engineer's perspective. And the one that we're talking about today is Zen and the Art of Voiceover. You know, if you're Gen X, I think you you didn't escape the 80s or 90s without reading the OG, which was Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Piercing. And one of the things that I loved so much about that book that I got a, a feeling from, from your book and your approach, 
You know, Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is all about this idea of quality. What, what gives things its intrinsicness? And I got that in a couple places out of your book and your approach. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, Dan, about this deep listening that people, and I'm gonna kind of say it this way and it's probably gonna come across wrong, but people who are addicted to sound, people who are addicted to the experience of sound and listening. Um, and you know, I, I, grabbed a, a, a com, I grabbed a quote out of your book that really kind of hit me as well as we move into a brief discussion of the script. Uh, you know, you said the most common reason uh, a voice delivery falls flat or fails to communicate is that the speaker is disconnected from the meaning of the script, the guts of the script. Understanding that a script is like a roadmap filled with indicators, signals, signs, highlights, that's the key to a successful delivery. And the more that you can identify those things, the better that read is going to be. To me, that speaks to this idea of when stuff is done right, when stuff is done with some sense of excellence, there's a quality there that goes beyond merely hearing it, and it makes you listen. And it engenders a feeling inside you, the listener, but also inside the performer. Can you speak a little bit to what a talent should be looking for in a script that helps them get there, that helps them bring that out of, of the copy? Sure. We have to remember, first of all, this feels sometimes feels a little bit like a contradiction because I will say the words, okay, are, yeah. your, are the key to your roadmap, but yet the words don't matter. <laughs> so let me explain that. First, the words are a roadmap. You want to definitely be, oh, let's just face it. You want to be aware of who the client is. That's just one big thing. If we're, you know, what, what is this? What are these words about? What is the product, service, or information? <laughs> we just got to know that. That's, that's fundamental. Yeah. Well, then we have to dig a little bit deeper and we have to understand that I, I have a perspective here. And they're looking for my perspective because I'm sharing this information. Now, why is that important? Well, because communication happens between at least two people. Now, when we talk about what to look for in the script, these are things that are emotions. Ultimately, what are the things that move you? Oftentimes that has a lot to do with the actions that the product service or information wants you to notice that they're taking or it's the actions they want you to take. So when we think about that, we want to be looking at the script and, and what are these things that they're doing and how do the, and then how do those things make me feel? And this is very general, right? It, but the only way that we are going to get somebody to listen to the logic. Here's the part where our words don't matter. The only way we can get our listener to get the logic of our words is to get to their prefrontal cortex where that processes in our brain. But that's not where our brain processes stuff first. Sound goes from me as a speaker or whoever's speaking to a listener into their ears. And when that sound goes into their ears, it goes into their amygdala. And the amygdala is responsible for a processing emotion in our brains. Yep. And if the listener does not like what it is that they're hearing, for whatever reason, it could be, it's too monotone. It could be, it's too nasal. It could be that this is just a really boring read and it just never really goes anywhere. And uh, after, you know, a few seconds, they just feel like they've heard the same thing. Right. And, and just tune Whatever, out. Mon mono resonant, or it may just lack emotion. It may just be, I'm just trying to sh throw information at you, or I'm simply playing with words, right? The listener will pick up on that. Whatever that, emo the, that emotion is, if they don't like the way we sh are sounding, and the emotions that, and they aren't picking up on the emotions we're trying to create, then there's no reason for them to listen to the logic of our words. And then we have failed the mission of communicating. 
Yeah. So that's why it's really important to use the script as a roadmap, identify the things that this script makes you feel. And based on who you are supposed to be, who you're supposed to be talking to, all this other stuff, right? There's a lot more involved, but basically I have to, in the, in the grand scheme of things is how does this make me feel? How do, how should the person feel on the other side that and, I'm sharing this information with? Yeah. And, and can I communicate that effectively? Yeah. And we're very similar in that regard in that I, I like you, I teach that us, us fancy monkeys, we're emotional listeners first. And like you said, if what we're saying or how we're saying it doesn't engender a, an emotional connection with the listener, they're already gone there. You're not going to be able to communicate the message you were tasked with getting through to somebody. If you're not addressing that emotional connection first, an emotional well, connection doesn't necessarily mean these big sweeping emotions. It can mean something as simple as Okay, I'm I'm really feeling what this person is saying. I'm feeling their emotional state in it and that makes me want to listen to what they're saying and not merely hear their face sounds. Well, I mean again, if you don't make that emotional connection, then the logic of the words doesn't matter. The it, for the it actual the, yeah. the, the words get lost anyway. So you're not achieving the goal of communicating. So it is absolutely important that you connect on an emotional level first. And that's another very interesting thing in, in being a coach is, you know, you really do. And uh, I have therapists in my family, but there is a lot of therapy things kind of that go that are involved. But uh, and I can't you know, don't want to get into all of those, but. Um, you realize that people do have trouble expressing their emotions or they're not aware of all their emotions or they're not aware of how they sound when they're in a certain emotion. Right. And all of this is okay, but it, as a coach, it's my job to uh, have them express these things. And the truth of the matter is, is that often isn't very different from an emotionless read as far as pitch, pace, tone, melody, volume, specifically any one of those things, or, uh, you know, it's not necessarily specific differences or grand changes in those things. However, uh, when you get to the ultimate read, it could be very similar in some of those things, but it still has an emotional foundation that cannot be duplicated. Yeah. just by sound alone or just by trying to give something to somebody because it's disingenuous. Yeah. You can't try to give somebody uh, really an emotion. It, it will, if you're trying to do it, it will sound disingenuous. It'll always be artificial. It always will be. That's, uh, I often, I often say when I'm talking to other people about coaching that I'm 49% voiceover coach and 51% therapist. Um, because like you say, if you, if you give somebody an emotion, they're going to be faking it to one degree or another. If you, as a coach or as a director, lead a talent into the experience of an emotion, then you're onto something. That's where you're going to get something genuine. The talent needs to be experiencing it for real to one degree or another for that reality to come through here. And it's the, it's the magic of being human, that that's what's different for us. That's what works for us. And that's what gets us to connect. Well, look, uh, we, we know that sound uh, affects us so much. We know that sound affects us so much, uh, often more than even visual things. Agreed. Um, so, uh, you know, you can hear a song and it will conjure visuals in your mind from a time 20, 30 years ago, easily, yep. ever, yeah, and you even will be, more. You will, you will be right back there where you were. That's exactly right. And that's really what how, the power of sound and emotion is. It can really take you right back in your brain to that same place and make you feel those same things. And what the benefit of experience is, is that. You've experienced many of those emotions, many, many, many emotions. You've experienced them multiple times. You've seen it happen in other people. 
And especially when you've worked in this business from the standpoint that, you know, that I have, I've, I've, I've had to see it. I've brought it out of people. I have experienced it myself. Right. And I've done it over and over and over and over again. And you know how to get back there. That's, oh, yeah. I think that's the big thing that that experience that, that miles under the wheels does is you can be great on mic. You can be fantastic on mic. You can have the golden voice and all that stuff. But if you don't have that life experience of going back and finding those emotional connections in yourself, it's awfully hard to instruct or to, to get somebody else to grok how to do that for themselves. Well, that's, that's, that's an even different subject. No. Really is can you bring it out in them? That's that's a whole nother element altogether. Fair, is can, fair can enough. You, yeah. Can you teach? Can you teach it and bring it out in them? Because yeah. some people, some people can play amazing guitar. Like for instance, I'm I'm a big Van Halen fan, as most people I know. know I especially noticed. if you read my book. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, Wolfgang Van Halen says that he never really got a lesson from his dad. Right. Uh, and you know, this is the greatest guitar player in the world. <laughs> so did he get a direct lesson? He said, you know, uh, only one time and it, and it was very basic. Like he showed him how to play ACDC or something. Right. And then after that it was done. Right. Um, and yet it just goes to show you that, um, that, uh, not everybody can be a great teacher, even though they have all that knowledge. So, mm -hmm. it, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, Question from left field before we jump into coaching. Is there any benefit to the cold read? Well, you should read your first read with no performance whatsoever. Okay. You should read your script out loud with no performance at all. And get your mind around the words. And you should do it out loud because if you do it in your head, when they, you're going to make assumptions and you're going to, first of all, when you're reading in your head, you're going to miss things. I can tell you 100% that if you make a mistake in your read in your mind, and then it comes out, it will come out in the words every time. Yep. And I have seen it happen so many times where somebody read that in their mind, then they read it out loud. A director has pointed that out to them yep. and they've done it again. And, and again. they've actually done it two or three or four more times to the point one person, well, I mean, not one person, but I'm specifically thinking of one incident where a person got fired, right? Because they just, did, they felt they just weren't taking direction. And could, if they couldn't take that simple direction, what are you going to do? Right? I mean, it's, it becomes a problem. Our so, unconscious minds are very tricky that way. And I, I completely agree with you that if you flub it up just in your head, it's like you're setting, it's like you're burying a landmine or a tripwire and you're going to be stumbling on that ev almost every single time you run at it. Yeah, well, let me tell you, well, let me tell you something else. It's not just that you also will lock yourself into a performance. <laughs> In other words, you now have made assumptions and assessments based on this read in your head where you may not have paid attention fully and <clears throat> new talent won't necessarily know what to, what questions to ask or how to assess it necessarily. Very experienced talent are complacent oftentimes in their approach to a script because they feel they read the first couple of words and they know, oh, I know what to do here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And they might be really missing the story. So you've got to read it out loud with no performance whatsoever. So you're kind of starting with a blank canvas so that now you've wrapped your mouth around the words and you can say, take a breath and start asking some questions and start answering those questions and assessing what is this, what am I really trying to communicate here? To whom am I trying to communicate? What is my intention? It is all about intentions. All about intention. Um, that is going to segue nicely into uh, the last half of our conversation here. Your book, Zen and the Art of Voiceover, 
you know, for me, again, and everybody knows it around me, I'm a Zen nerd. Uh, and, um, you know, we have this idea in Zen called beginner's mind. And what you just said really kind of tickled that bone for me. This idea that we start out with something and we put it out as simply as we can, as effectively as we can to lay the groundwork. But every time we come back to it, we try to come back to it fresh with intention, but, but not bringing in preconceptions. I love your idea of the first time you read copy, it should be with no performance. Because like you, I've experienced it where if I do a performance, that performance is now the base level of the read. And I will struggle. I will struggle with bringing something new or fresh to it. And I've, I've been called out by directors myself of that was too much like your A take. Can you, can we, can we step away from that? Um, how do you as a talent, when you've done that initial read, what's your technique then for, for ratcheting up or going down or bringing fresh things to a read that you're tasked with doing either in a directed session or actually probably more difficult in a self-directed session? How do you bring something new to something that you've done 11 times? Well, first of all, every script is different. So therefore, every line in that script means something different at that time. And if you are aware of what those meanings are, what would be the challenge in that in life, really? Right. Let me, let me, let me, let me put it this way. You and I are talking voiceover right now, and it is a subject that I enjoy. I can talk about this all day long. Right. Really, I could. And in sure. fact, you know, I mean, we could go another two hours, no problem. <laughs> Easy, right? Talking about this. Absolutely. Now, but I'm not thinking about how I'm saying anything that's coming out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Now I talked about voiceover yesterday, talked about voiceover the day before. So, and, and you know what? I'm just as passionate, but I probably was in different contexts when I talk about it yesterday. And I probably was in a different context when I talked about it the day before. So let's take every script a a as an individual piece, right? And say, look, just because you can't make assumptions that this is the same. I have a, I have a script that begin that I use often for training. It's usually the very first one that I put in front of somebody. Mm. And I, I like to use this as an example because a lot of people will go into their, uh, read, like I said, especially experienced talent who get a little complacent and they see the first two words and the two, these have, these two words happen to be my Camry. Now as a voice actor, my Camry, Okay, I know. I'm I know what I'm going to this is a car commercial and I'm going right. to write. I mean, you make all these assumptions about it and it's going to mm -hmm. be you know, and I'm going to be really happy and excited about this whatever. Well, what if at the end of this script your Camry killed somebody in an accident? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like Yep. It's basically you're making assumptions based on what you think you know before you actually know it. Yeah. And I remember Literally two words in two words, two in, words your in. assumptions are that deep and that strong that right. Because again, and it, and it's not, it's not any, it's not your fault, right? It's just that because you're so used to it, you're so you get, you know, especially if you're experienced, like I said, you've done it a long time. You, ex, you have certain expectations, but sometimes, especially now, because the world is wide open in opportunity when it comes to voiceover, there's more opportunity out there now than ever before. I'm not saying that the, that the rates are ever any better or that, you know, we won't get into all of that. Yeah. That's a whole other conversation. And, you know, a different kettle of worms, yeah. whole different kettle of worms. And there are people far more, you know, uh, qualified to talk about dollars and cents than me. But what I will say is that, you know, every script is different and therefore there's no reason in the world that we should treat one uh, as the same as the other, especially if we read through it. And yes, if it, if all of our, if all our beliefs are supported by what we actually read there, 
okay, great. Yeah, fantastic. Then at least, then at le- yeah. then at least we know from experience that this is similar to something we've done in the past. However, I still have to use these words as my roadmap to tell me what this script wants and what this listener wants to feel or needs to feel or what I feel about it. I still need to go through that process. And when you work with me and you do my process for getting people to do that, I always say, this might feel tedious at first. Some people say, no, I love it. And other people say, well, yeah, it's a, you know, it's a lot. I never thought of it this way before. I say, great, but do it because I promise you it's going to get faster and easier the more you do it and you'll get so much better at it. And really, in the end, this is about saving time. Yeah. Time is money and time is our most valuable asset. And when you're and, you know, if you can get better at this, whatever it is, we talked a little bit earlier about knowing history and and things like that. The reasons for all of this stuff is so you can get better and more efficient at what you do so that you can have the time to do the things that you want to do and love to do. And if this is it, that's also great. Lucky, lucky you, but right. also, to, but also to help other people have the time that they need uh, in order to uh, do the things that they love and want to do. Right. Yep. So if you can, if I always said, you know, as when I'm in, when I'm in the booth as a voice actor, or even as an engineer, there, there's really a couple of goals. Right. And of course, absolutely please the client, make them happy, uh, over, over deliver on everything. But that also includes getting them out to lunch early. Right. Right. So because they may not, they, if they have an extra hour for lunch, because they recorded, you know, they booked a four hour session and you're their, uh, you, you're and their hero, man. That's exactly right. You, you, you took an hour of their day, which was probably already going to be a fun hour because they went to the recording studio and sure. you know, this is old school stuff a little bit because right, we're talking, right. right. But this is a, this is a mindset. Right. This is a mindset from coming from this old school a little bit is that, you know, time is really valuable and that's often we're paid by the hour oftentimes. Right. So a lot of these things matter. So if you could not only, uh, you know, get into that four hour session that they booked, blow them away with a great performance and get them out so that they can go and have a really nice lunch before going back to the office. You've made yeah. their day. You're a wizard, man. <laughs> exactly, exactly right. And now the the even though the landscape has changed a lot, the mindset should remain the same. And because the, it's really about customer service. And it's about also keeping in mind that as a self-directed talent, as a solo worker in your own space, you still have the ability to to give that gift of time. It's just it might be a gift To your partner, you're able to work on dinner with them an hour earlier, or you're able to get that client, their material back, not up against their clock, but with time to spare Uh, that. That's what coaching is. That's what coaching is about in a nutshell, right? Yep. It is making people more efficient at what they're tasked with doing. Well, not, but not just that, but taking them from point A to point B faster, right? Yeah. Because, and let, cause if you're not working in this business and you're not listening in this business with the intention that you should be, and you don't even know what you don't know, then how can you possibly, you might get somewhere, but it might, it's more likely to take you 10 years if you have a goal and I'm just throwing a number out randomly, but you know, it might take you 10 years, but getting coaching and getting good advice and, you know, obviously coaching knows what they're doing and, and has experience and can bring this stuff out of you. Right. That may take, reduce that 10 years to two years. And isn't that a worthwhile investment on your own behalf? I, I mean, it's an investment in your time and in your life getting closer to being able to do the thing that you want to do. Hopefully. I mean, well, honestly, if you don't want to do this, then don't do it. (laughs) I I guess. Yeah. That's like saying, if you don't want to get better at what you choose to do, yeah, feel free to stay average. Um, I agree with you. And that, you know, I say that and I understand that it sounds self-serving because I'm a coach as well, but I say this because this was my direct experience. 
I jumped into this industry and I got a little bit of work right away and that was great and everything. But then I got into that place where it was just, man, tumbleweeds rolling by. And the next thing that I did was I listened to somebody who said that the best way to get better faster is with coaching. And I did that. And the next thing I knew, and it wasn't an overnight thing, please, you know, my listeners and viewers, don't get me wrong on this. Coaches aren't miracle workers, um, but it did amplify my own efforts. And a lot of that comes directly from what you just said. And that is working with a coach gets you these experiences and that feedback, that immediate feedback that probably shaved. I would say it shaved at least four or five years off of my path into this industry as a full-time earner. I went from a part-time dabbler to a full-time earner. Um, and no, you know, your mileage may vary their viewer and listener, but at the same time, I know me and I know that I wouldn't be where I am today without having worked with some really good coaches. But that brings me to the question. We're now in this world where I think more than ever, the general public is now aware that home VO is a thing. Back at the beginning of the millennium, it was still kind of like the dark arts and people didn't understand how it happened and how people could work in this industry from their bedroom. But now that, and as you said earlier, the pandemic really kind of made everybody aware of, you can do this from home because why? Everybody was looking, how can I earn a living from home in the safety of my own bunker? But with that has come a lot of new coaches. And I've got a question uh, from one of my followers who said, you know, how do you feel about these new coaches who are promising the world and are, you know, they're, they're very slick on the outside and you see advertisements for them. You get on YouTube or on social media and you see these very, and they're now kind of iconic advertisements for, you know, do voiceovers from home and et cetera, et cetera. How do you feel about that? Which is kind of a stupid, obvious question, but also in your opinion, Dan, how can you spot them and how can you avoid them? Yeah, well, one of the things I talk about in my book is do research, right? Now, people are – I live in a house with two teenage boys, and I was once a teenage boy. And one thing I can tell you is that I can tell you that I can look around this house and not find something that I've been looking for very easily. And they were the same way at times, and it often involves just simply moving something – and looking behind yep. something else. Kind of a stupid uh, metaphor, but nonetheless. No, the thing I is, feel, is, I feel it in my core. It's so you know, like, a great metaphor. Yeah, like, you know, peek behind the curtain. Now, yep. I can tell you that there are companies out there that have been in the voiceover business a long time that, uh, you know, are coaching companies. Uh, and I, I, I worked for a school for a long time and I think that their program is, and I'm not going to mention any names just because if people want to know, they can find, they can find me, they know how to find research, all this. So I'm not going to mention any names just sure for enough. the sake of keeping it, keeping it neutral. Okay. I worked for one for a long time and they have a really excellent program for newcomers that, uh, you know, that, uh, that really want to know the all sides of the business and, and all of that. Now, you know, is it great for experienced talent? I don't necessarily think so. I don't know that a, a program like that would necessarily match with somebody who's been doing it a long time. I don't know that they need all those services, that sort of thing. There's other schools out there that uh, I have known for years and I have listened to their demos and the things that they've done. And I know that they're not necessarily doing a great job and they are um, taking advantage of people and they are making promises that they shouldn't be. And a lot of their coaches have not been working in the industry a very long time, even though that they're a school that has, you know, that, 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 that has been in business for a long time. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they're hiring talent that have only been in the business a short time and, and that's not really helpful. 
I'm just saying, you know, again, I, I, I'm not here to put anybody down. I'm not here to criticize anybody necessarily. I, I hate to see people get uh, taken advantage of. I know that in any given day, I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, all I have to do is be in competition with myself and provide the best possible boutique customer service experience that I can because I'm a one man operation. Right. Um, but I will gladly put my demos up that I produce up against anybody's out there. I will gladly put my experience up against anybody's out there. And, and then, that, and that's all I have to really worry about. I, I, a lot of these schools, a lot of these other coaches, some of them have good advice to share. They, they have some experience and they have some good advice to share. It's when they start promoting bad advice yeah, or they, or, or, I get a talent coming to me that tells me who their coach was and I have to undo or fix a lot of things that was not, were never picked up by that coach. Yeah. The, which transfer, of, the transfer of bad habits. It, it is happening more and more. Uh, yeah. It is happening more and more. Uh, I will tell you. And you know, th it is what it is. I, 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 I'm never going to be able to, I can't fight the market. It's a big, bad world. Out there, right. You know what exactly. I mean? Exactly. And it, you're so, only one dude with a shield and a sword, you know? Um, I, I, yeah. All I can do is continue to just try to do the best I can to help the most amount of people I can in the best way that I can and let the chips fall where they may. And that's kind of the Zen of my, you know, yeah. my existence is that I really, uh, you know, especially since the pandemic, I, I, I just r refuse to, uh, I don't know about refuse, but I'm certainly a little more resistant to things that I don't enjoy as much, even in my job. I enjoy yeah. helping people. I enjoy making people, uh, transforming people's voices and deliveries. I love that. I love mixing and sound design. Uh, I love playing music and getting back into being able to focus on that now that I'm not raising two teenagers <laughs> or two kids anymore. Yeah, uh, as got them to the point person. where they're self maintenizing a little bit more. Well, I mean, one is going to be leaving or one left for college already. Uh, and the other one, uh, even though he's graduated college, he wants to move uh, to New York City, although not today because it's terrible there today. Yeah. It's raining. So I'm glad he's not there today. Yeah. Uh, I know this will probably air another time, but nonetheless, this That's is okay. uh, universally, to... universally applicable. Um, yeah, we don't, we don't like flooding. That's for sure. Uh, no. But anyway, he plans to do that. So yeah, I mean, you know, empty, uh, actually I was going to say empty nest, but, uh, I heard this term the other day and I really liked it. Uh, I'm not an empty nester. I'm a bird launcher. There you go. I dig that. You're right. That's cool. The only thing I was going to say that's good about an empty nest is an empty nest is a quieter nest normally depending because right now I've got garbage guys right outside my door here behind my camera making all sorts of racket. Dan, as we close out here, um, one of the things that I really want to ask that actually was given to me by uh, another one of my followers, Seth Kennedy, you know, I want to be clear that I don't think you and certainly not me are saying that people who are newer into the industry, the industry, not life, but the industry, we're not saying that they don't have good techniques to share. And we're not saying that you need to be a 50 year veteran to be a coach, but no, you're right. Because some people are just naturally gifted, naturally talented, or worked with somebody who is really talented and is carrying that wisdom forward. But do you think that there's a number? Do you think that there's some length of time where a performer really needs to be down in the trenches before they can successfully transition into being a voiceover coach? Uh, I don't know. That's a really hard question. I know because, it's an impossible question. I, well, I understand. Okay. Yeah. It's an impossible question because there's too many factors, but let me, let me just put it this way. I, I I'm going to make a guitar analogy. Uh, and hopefully it'll be relevant. A few of my people speak guitar, so I think we're okay, going to be okay. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I'm, and I'm, I, and I think this will work. So, um, I once saw the question: Would you rather, uh, to an experienced guitarist, would you rather play with a guitar player who plays every day but has been playing for two years, or a guitar player who used 
to play and play well, but hasn't played in two years. Interesting. Right. So that is kind of an interesting question, right? Yeah. So how do you look at it? Um, there's a lot of factors involved, right? Well, did they play for eight hours for those? Uh, did they play for eight hours in that every day for two years? Or did they play for a half an hour or right. 20 minutes? So the point is, is that there's so many factors involved that and so much to consider. I will tell you, though, just from a common sense standpoint, is that listening takes time. And if you've only been in the business for three years, if you haven't really worked with a lot of other talent, and if you haven't spent a lot of time listening or directing other direct or uh, other talent and listening to other directors work and listening to other talent work and all those things, then you just don't have a lot to compare to. Yeah. You don't have a lot in your library of experience to really be able to honestly sh uh, have, uh, you know, a, a, a bank from which to draw. Yeah. A solid now, reference library. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's a big element to this. Now you might be an amazing teacher and, and, and I don't want to discard the fact that, Hey, if you worked in a related industry, okay. If you, or if you got your MFA in theater or whatever, right. Mm -hmm. That is related experience and it's absolutely relevant and is by, you know, absolutely a, an element of coaching that, it, you know, makes you, makes it more valid for somebody that, okay, they've been in voiceover for three years, but maybe they've got this acting degree or they've been working in a studio as a director before that. Right. I mean, related experience. Those are things it's, it's, it's somebody who only is been doing this for a very short time and doesn't have even related experience that I'm more concerned about. Right. Uh, yeah. those, those are the people that you really have to worry about. So, uh, you know, that, that, I guess that's all I have to say. I know. I, I, I think, and that, I hope my guitar analogy worked. <laughs> uh, it, it struck a chord with me. Oh, mm. wait. Yeah. Yeah. No. Well done. <laughs> that's the, that's the beauty of Bravo. post. I just put in a dry, just put in a rim shot there. Dan, this has been such a treat getting a chance to finally connect with you person to person, talent to talent. Um, do me a favor. Hit people with where they can find you, where they can get a hold of you, where they can find the book, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously everything that you say is going to be mirrored down here uh, in the show notes. But yeah, tell people where they can follow you. Yeah, absolutely. I, of course, I'm on all the social media networks pretty much. I, I actually am not really very uh, active on Twitter or X whatever, or whatever it's called now. Yeah. Whatever the hell they call it now. Right. Uh, I, I, I honestly a dumpster couldn't... fire is what I call it now, but you know, that's yeah, my own I, opinion. I, yeah. I, I couldn't care less about that one mostly, Same. but I'm largely of course on Instagram. I really actually have come to like doing uh, videos on TikTok on a, and on Instagram. I, I think, I don't know if we were talking about it earlier. I've about enjoyed have... your TikTok stuff very much. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, good. Totally. I'll make sure to link down there to, some of my highlights because yeah, you're, you're real good with delivering the wisdom in those nice little chunks that, uh, hit people square in the uh, square between the eyes. <laughs> well, well, thank in a good you. Way, in a good it. way. Sorry. Not in a violent way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, of course, my website, sound the number four vo.com sound four vo, uh, find me there of course uh go through the blogs so you had mentioned you know the blogs yeah. being a big part of your kind of up i, I want to encourage people to go there again and to be reading those blogs because it one of the things that i uh have really found interesting when i was putting this new book together is going back to some of those blogs and realizing you know what this stuff is still really hey, relevant. i was gonna say <laughs> on your behalf brother it doesn't matter when you said it I can't point to something that you said even back to 2012, 2013, that's not still relevant and doesn't still resonate today in today's industry. 
Thank you. Thank so. you. That's very kind of you. It's, it's, it's as surprising to me as anybody. <laughs> Sometimes those are the best surprises in life. Listen, everybody, this has been an absolute treat. Dan, I owe you a solid brother. I'm really grateful that you were able to come on. And to everybody else, I'm Andrew Scott. That's Dan Friedman. This has been Booth to Booth. And as always, see you guys in the booth. Take care, everybody. Talk to you soon. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Bye-bye. From the beautiful Pacific Northwest, this has been Booth to Booth with Andrew Scott. Booth to Booth is a narrowband broadcast network production in association with andrewscottmedia.com. Andrew Scott, executive producer. Our theme music was written and produced by Ron Kajawa. Website design and maintenance by Vacano Creative. Christopher Vacano, webmaster. Available at vacanocreative.com. Audio and video production by Andrew Scott. Available at andrewscottmedia.com. Got topic ideas, questions, or comments for the show? Email us at patchin at boothtobooth.com or by simply clicking the link in the description. On behalf of host Andrew Scott, I'm Gwen Steele. From our booth to yours, thanks for joining us. See you next time on Booth to Booth. NBBN. The Narrow Band Broadcast Network. The focus is on you.